you sort of had that dream since you were young of playing for Australia and then when it's staring you in the face, you're thinking, oh, I couldn't think of anything worse. Will Kukowski is considered by many to be the future of Australian cricket. <laughs> 22 years old, confident, assured, and with an immeasurable amount of talent. For the last few years, Will has been poised to become one of Australia's next great sporting stars. Poised, but not yet taking that final step. In 2019, Will was all but set to take the baggy green. Favoured for selection in a two-match series against Pakistan, the first of the summer, and an audition for the monstrous challenge of a touring India. Will's dream of playing for Australia was about to come true. But at the last second, Will stepped away and vacated his position, abandoning his potential for selection and returning home to Victoria in a cloud of media-driven rumours. I remember sort of reading things from journalists that I'd never spoken to them, no one close to me had ever spoken to them. It was far from the truth and I found that quite hard to deal with. Will's decision to step away was motivated by a renewed focus on his mental well-being. Cricket Australia stood by Will and his decision, but public speculation wasn't always so understanding. You have no idea what I'm going through or what I'm trying to do here. Like, report on what you know, not what Jim's mate from the pub told you or something along those lines. As Australia's summer of cricket began, the absence of the country's brightest star was more than noticeable. And questions surrounding Will's future and how he would return to the game and if he would be able to regain his footing began to arise. Before we go any deeper into answering those questions, we have to take a step back and returned to one of Will's most formative moments, an under-19s national championship in Adelaide, representing Victoria Metro. Got to that 19s tournament and we're sitting there and I, I got 21 on the first day and just mentally, I didn't feel like I was anywhere near my best, like in terms of how I was batting. It didn't feel like I was sort of in that zone where you think you're in a good place to succeed. We were there and uh, got that sort of, I guess, medium, medium range score. Like, it's not a great score, but it's not making a duck or anything like that. But I had a chat to Dad that night on the phone. I said, Dad, I just got so much stuff going through my head about like what's going on in the game, what am I going to do, what, what's going to happen in five overs, what's going to happen in ten overs. And he just said, mate, just relax tomorrow, just go out there, watch the ball, uh, trust your instincts and, and see what happens. So I went, all right, I'll, I'll give that a crack. basically took it down to its simplest form and just went every ball I'm just going to stand pretty comfortably at the crease I didn't worry about my stance I didn't worry about pre-movements I didn't worry about what shots I was going to play or or necessarily even the scoreboard and I just batted and got got a hundred and something not out that day and um sort of called dad that night again going gee dad you're a genius that that was actually really effective and then went out and did it the next, or did it for the rest of the tournament, made another three hundreds on the back of that. And all of a sudden you'd gone from one Monday night thinking, gee, I'm, I'm not making it in cricket. Like I need to, I need to get sorted at uni and stuff. Cause I've got to, um, got to work something out to two weeks later. You're sort of being talked about in a lot, in a, in a much different, 
I guess, uh, scope. So it was, uh, it was quite a rare moment, I guess, just in terms of how much it sort of opened my eyes to what the, the best way to succeed was, especially in a sport where, where cricket can be particularly cruel at times, I think. That moment, I think you're almost being too understated. You scored more runs than anyone had ever scored in that competition, including Ricky Ponting. And that's a remarkable achievement in the history of Australian cricket, uh, let alone for someone you know of your um, uh, age at that time, uh, in terms of the expectations that that brings, in, in terms of the momentum that, that that brings. But if you want to dig down to it for me, what do you think it was that allowed you to disconnect like that? Because having a conversation with your dad is one thing, but then walking out onto the field the next day for uh, Victoria Metro and standing in the crease, having the bowler coming at you, all of a sudden, in theory, disconnecting and just being in the moment sounds great, but you're there, the emotions are playing, your teammates are looking at you. What allowed you to enact that advice so effectively, so quickly? I think part of it was I'd sort of struggled, as I said, over probably a couple of years with like not performing to the level that I really wanted to and, and probably knew I was capable of. And I think for me it was just almost taking that pressure off myself and just going, you know what, all I can do is, is give my best. And I never actually thought about it like that. In my head, cricket was always about oh, I have to you know, do this and this and this at this stage of a game and whatever and stuff like that. And there was just way too much going on in my head instead of the the simple nature of, all right, I'm just going to stand here, watch the ball, and then back that my talent will will get me to where I deserve to be. It's still something at 22 that I'm working on now. Like, And it's it's harder. Every level you go up, it gets harder and harder because that self-doubt creeps back in and you start thinking, oh, well, it was good enough at that level, but it might not be good enough at this level. But I've had plenty of instances in the last three years or, or however long it's been since that tournament where... I've sort of relearnt that lesson and I think it's going to be part of the journey going forward and whether I'm able to succeed. Was it almost giving yourself permission to fail? I think that was part of it. I think a lot of it was, it's almost, the way I put it in, I guess, cricket terms is I went out there to make runs instead of went out there to not get out. So it was going, all right, I'm just going to try and score runs today, not I'm going to try and not get out. And that just gave me that freedom to go, you know what, if it doesn't work today, hopefully it works tomorrow and it's sort of that... Yeah, that sort of mindset of, as you said, permission to fail. And I think I'd had everything riding on every inning. So it was such a, it was such a sort of inner determination to, to not get out. And I think that was shaped, thinking back on it, probably from junior cricket where you get to a certain score and you retire. And I was just always so determined to retire and make sure I didn't get out as a junior. And I think it's kind of bizarre how even when you're eight years old, it sort of shapes you for how you're going to be when you're 19 or 20 or, or beyond. Tell me about how it felt at the end of that competition when he'd achieved that historic record. What was that like? It was bizarre. It, literally over a 12-day period, you felt like you, your life had almost changed forever. All of a sudden, people were talking about you in quite glowing terms. If I'm honest, I, I loved it early because it was sort of um, your first taste of a bit of public interest and stuff and you're thinking, gee, I'm pretty cool here. Like, uh, I'm in the paper, I'm on the news. Like, everyone back home is going to think it's pretty crash hot and um, you're thinking it's the best thing ever, but then reality hits pretty quickly and, and you realise there's a bit more to life after a week or two of living the high life. You were rapidly selected to the Victorian team after that point as well, weren't you? Tell me about that. That was another experience that was quite daunting, to be honest. Um, daunting and e extraordinarily exciting at the same time. Like, I couldn't probably split the emotions at the time. But I'd gone from playing seconds at my local club team at the start of that season to three or four months later, I just got a call on a Sunday afternoon from the Victorian coach. I hadn't been at any training sessions ever, hadn't been around the group at all. Um, got a call just saying like, mate, are you available to come down to training tomorrow, which was going to be the Monday. And I was like, oh yeah, yeah, I am. The next Shield game was starting on that Wednesday. 
and I just thought, oh, they're just sort of rewarding me for going well at the under-19s tournament. I'd made a couple of hundreds in club cricket. I'd done okay in a second 11 game for Victoria. But I was sort of like, oh, it'll just be a bit of a reward for that. We get to be around the group and that'll be good fun. And then after the first training session, the, the coach pulled me aside and goes, mate, we've, we've picked you in the squad of 14 for Wednesday. Um, there's obviously three that are going to miss out, but, but you're in the 14. And I was like, oh, gee, that's, that's pretty cool. And again, it was sort of along the lines of, oh, they probably just rewarded me again. They'll pick me in this 14, but there's no way I'm being the actual 11. Like, it'd just be a way to sort of say, all right, um, congratulations, like, you've, you've done really well, but you're not thinking that you're just going to sort of suddenly, after training twice, walk into a Shield team and then... The day before the game, I got I got pulled aside and they said, mate, you, you're going to bat at five tomorrow. And I just remember going like, you are kidding. But this is just surreal. And I, I reckon I got about an hour's sleep that night, if I was lucky. I was, uh, yeah, pretty anxious, excited, everything under the sun, and then, yeah, it was pretty keen to just get out there and, and get it going by the time it started. I'd played every scenario over in my head, and a lot of it for me was about just getting that first run. Like, I just really wanted to make a run to say, you know what, regardless of what happens after today, I've made a first-class run. So I remember being incredibly anxious before I went out to bat. And then we got to, I think it was just before lunch on day one, and we lost a couple of quick wickets. And all of a sudden I was in facing my first ball and you had the backdrop of the MCC stand at the G and you're in this huge 100,000 seater stadium with about 120 people sitting in it, of which about 50 of your mates and family that have come to watch your debut. could hear everything they said and they had um for any cricket people out there they had Dougie Bollinger running in from the members end and he was going down to fine leg where all my mates were sitting and they were ripping into him in between overs so he was coming back angrier and angrier every over and I'm just going boys like you got to give me a break here like be nice to him or something and then I sort of remember I got to I got to 28, I think it was, and it, it was sort of felt like a bit of a blur. Like I just got there just by, I, I don't even remember, I couldn't even really recall many shots I played or anything like that. But then I sort of remember the feeling of going like, hang on a minute, I belong here. Like, I'm going okay. Like, this isn't too bad. Unfortunately, the next day, I got smacked in the head in the field and just like a ball skipped up off the off one of the old pitches and, and hit me in the head. I was out concussed for the rest of the game and the rest of that season. That wasn't your first concussion, was it? You had a few before that. I would have been 16. AFL footy, I got, I got smacked in the head um, at training. One of my best mates kneed me in the head. Missed six months of school. That was probably one of the, one of the biggest struggles I'd had to go through. And you sort of just go through a lot of stuff when you go through that because you're not doing what you normally do and you don't really know what's going on. Feel good some days and then bad some others you think you're sort of making it up what, what did a good day look like and what did a bad day look like during that recovery period a good day was sort of being able to go for a walk uh get out of the house go maybe see a friend or two a bad day was pretty much on the couch all day don't really have the energy don't really have the sort of the physical capability to get off the couch um the tougher thing about the concussions wasn't necessarily the severity of them, but more so that a lot of the time you did actually feel okay. And it was the worst thing was when you're thinking like, no, nah, I'm fine, like this should be okay. But then you sort of push yourself too hard or do too much and that day you get home, you got a shocking headache or 
you're not sort of seeing straight and you're just like, what is going on? Like, this is ridiculous. Tell me about when you sort of came back to uh, lucid consciousness uh, after that hit representing Victoria. Um, what did it feel like having already had that six month experience of being off from school on the previous concussions and then coming down from the high of your first representative game at a state level? What was that like? I sort of remember wearing it in the head pretty heavily and I was like, gee, that's knocked me around a bit and sort of looking up and everything was a bit blurry and dizzy and I'm sitting there and probably in a state of shock to some degree. And going like, not again, like this cannot be happening again, like not now. And you're sort of looking up and everything's sort of still a bit all over the shop. You're feeling a bit wobbly. I just sort of half remember taking myself off the ground and sort of said, and they'd seen the footage, they'd been sort of clipped in the head by, by the ball and I was like, oh, something's not right here, like I'm not seeing straight, I'm not feeling great, like I had a bit of a headache coming on and then I remember being sort of down in the rooms and sort of talking them through it and then after that I think I just sort of fell asleep and was just out for ba basically the whole day and just was in and out of sort of a daze and um, it obviously wasn't ideal and then uh, it sort of just went through and they're trying to sort of ask you every day how you're feeling and you don't want to let people down but at the same time you're not right. It was a really tough situation to be in especially for someone who'd just come into the squad didn't really know anyone that well like you felt like you were letting a lot of people down that you'd idolised before you'd obviously got to play with them in that game so that was quite challenging in itself because you obviously have the concussion symptoms and you're feeling pretty bad physically and then that extra sort of layer on top of feeling like you're letting, letting a lot of people down was pretty tough. You strike me as the sort of person that would push themselves, um, you know, to the nth degree for the people around you. And I imagine the sense of not being able to do that and having that always be a question mark as to can I actually do what's necessary to support the team? That must have been extraordinarily tough. How did you know when you were back up to scratch that you could go back again? How did you measure that or who was it that measured it for you? Well, that season actually ended before I sort of had the chance. So we'd been, I probably was out for a month and a half before that season ended. And in a, to a degree, it was actually a relief for me because it was sort of that stress or that burden off you sort of people calling and asking you right to play this week and sort of go like, no, I'm not. It's sort of one of those things where you're getting asked by a doctor as well, like, are you okay? Like, what's going on? And because there's no real... I guess, effective thing to say you've definitely got over this concussion or you definitely haven't. It's that grey area which makes it extra tough and I'd probably had the, I don't want to call it a trauma, but um, the, I guess, severe head injury at school which had probably made me a bit more cautious about it just because I didn't want to go down that path again of having sort of six months where you're not at school, you're in and out of things and um, probably feeling that, as you said, feeling that pressure of feeling like you're letting other people down and you can't compete to the level you want to or or be part of it and you've got a lot of stories going around in your head like oh everyone's just going to think you're weak or you're soft and and that only multiplies kind of the stress that you put on yourself I would say. This is all after of course Australia's lived experience with what happened to Philip Hughes and I guess bringing to the national consciousness the damage that these sorts of injuries can occur in thankfully extremely rare circumstances but I imagine for a young man like yourself playing at that level and having had that be a part of the the national psyche around concussion that must have been a pretty scary thing yeah it was um yeah it was I, I sort of remember when when Husey unfortunately passed away and your first couple of sort of hits after it you were just absolutely terrified. You go, wow, like that could actually happen and that's happened to a bloke in his prime with his cricket, in his prime with his life and, and that's been taken away from him and, and everyone around him. One of the most unlucky things that could have occurred but it just happened on that day which, 
yeah, it was, I think, quite traumatic for the whole cricket community, to be honest, because everyone's going, like, if that, if that can happen, like, there's no reason it couldn't be me next time. And on top of that, having to deal with the loss of, of someone who, who plays the same sport as you do to such a great level that, that he did. I think that it's, uh, it's easy for people to underappreciate the bravery that must have been required uh, for you to step back onto the, uh, the team uh, after that experience. Uh, what was it like to step back out there again for the first time after that downtime? Uh, the first time's always pretty tough. Like every ball, you're sort of just, you're very conscious of sort of getting hit again. Um, and I've had a few, a few since then, but I've sort of noticed the more I guess you get out there, the more you just go, I'm going to have to back my my instincts again that I'm going to be good enough. And a lot of it is about trying to sort of clear your mind again and getting into that state of um, almost meditation to a degree where you're just going, all I can do is control the controllables and focus on these controllables. So the first probably couple of times you go back out, you're, you're really conscious of it and it's really tough to try and get yourself back into that zone. But I've probably been through it so many times now that I've almost learned to process to try and get through it and just go, you know what, like, I know so far I've been able to come back, so there's no reason I won't be able to come back and succeed again the next time. This week's episode of The Risk Equation is brought to you by Alt Drop Coffee. Alt Drop is an online coffee marketplace that's helping support local Melbourne businesses and creating a sustainable, fair and stress-free coffee buying experience. All of Altrop's coffees are roasted, ground, packaged and shipped from Melbourne directly to your door. And the prices are a lot lower than you might expect as well. Altrop prices start from just $15 a bag. And that $15 bag is coming from a small, local and sustainable Melbourne roaster instead of your giant supermarket brands. Altrop have set up a 10% discount code exclusive to listeners of The Risk Equation. That code is RISK, like the name of the show. That's code RISK for 10% off at altrop.com.au. And thanks again to Altrop for sponsoring this week's episode. We really appreciate it. Now back to the show. Tell me about October of 2018 when you're representing Victoria against WA and you score uh, what turns out to be a historic double century uh, in that game. Uh, Tell me about that experience. Yeah, it's a long story, so <laughs> I hope you got some time. But it, it, how do I, how do I even start? So I remember sort of getting to that game, and things probably just weren't right. It was the first game of the season, and I just, I felt different. I couldn't even describe to you how I felt different. I just didn't. I wasn't overly excited about the game. Not that I, I'm always very nervous about games. And this game, I was less nervous, but more just like, I guess, feeling a bit benign. I don't know if that's the right word or not. We bowled on the first day and um, I remember dropping a catch in the field, which for anyone who knows in cricket is a, is a really bad feeling. And uh, I just remember thinking like, this is so bad. Like, what am I doing here? Like, this is, I'm not enjoying this at all. This is just not for me. And I was just sitting there and I'd played probably, it would have been 10 or 15 first class games by this stage and never really felt this kind of uh, detachment, I guess, if that's the right word. So we bowled them out maybe in 60 overs and I was batting at three. We lost an early wicket, so I was out there pretty early. And um, I sort of remember I was batting and I was sort of, again, just in a pretty detached state. And I got to 60-odd not out overnight, which usually I would be absolutely stoked with. I'd be going, you beauty, like, chance to make 100 tomorrow. How good is this? Like, super excited about it. Um, and I remember just going back and I was in my hotel room just flat as a tack. Walking to the game the next day, sort of got up and I just, usually I like sort of being around some of the boys, like I want to walk to the ground with someone. 
I remember just wanting to be by myself. So I, walk, I was walking down and there's a park opposite the Wacka, which is sort of on the way from our, our hotel that we stay at. And I just started bawling my eyes out. And I had, I couldn't have even remembered the last time I'd cried before then. It would have been when I was 10 years old. I had no idea why, I was just sad, I guess. And the only thing I could do was cry. Spoke to one of the coaches who I was, well, I was co uh, close with all the coaches, but one that I was particularly close with and just said, mate, like, I've got no idea what's going on here. Like, I don't, I'm having a breakdown or something, but I'm just, I've just bawled my eyes out. Like, I don't, I don't know. And he's just like, let us know if we can do anything for you. Obviously, if you feel okay to bat, like, if, if you don't, that's fine. But if you feel okay to bat, just, just continue. And I was like, yeah, I'll be fine. I'll go out and bat. I sort of remember batting that day and just being in this detached state, but it was just such an eye-opening experience from a sort of a skill point of view. I remember just being out there going like, this is so simple. I just switch off completely in between balls, think about nothing, switch on for the two seconds I need to, play whatever shot I feel like I need to to that ball and then go back to switching off. and. Without any sort of, it felt like no effort really, I'd got to 240. I walk off the ground, we'd made 500, we'd set up the game and I was, wasn't even remotely tired. It almost felt like an out of body experience in a in a way like it was just so so strange in that sense and probably for the first time I it was the first time I'd ever actually gone I'm actually a really good player and that was from an objective point of view like that was no emotional attachment to that it's just I remember sort of sitting there and the only thing that kept me going throughout the whole day was I didn't want to let my teammates down I knew if I kept batting I was setting up the team but from a personal point of view I had no attachment to the score no attachment to what I was doing didn't really care for it even when I was making sort of going through the milestones had no real investment in sort of raising the bat I remember going home that or not home but to the hotel that night and I would have had hundreds of text messages phone calls everything you want just anyone who I'd basically ever met before congratulating me, saying how proud they were, how happy I must be. And I remember sitting there going like, nah, like this just it has no meaning to me. Like I've got no attachment to this in any way. What was it that led to that state? Because it obviously you'd had the concussion a little bit before that in the recovery period. But leading up to that game in WA, looking back on it with a little bit of distance now, is there anything that you can point to to say those were the things that were leading me there or those were the symptoms, the early symptoms of what happened on that day? I think it was a long time coming. Like when I look back on it, I just go, I think most of the issues started around my first concussion. I didn't acknowledge them. I didn't pay any attention to them. I didn't really stress about them at all because I just sort of assumed, oh, it's part of this concussion thing. Like this will be, I'll get over it when... I get over this concussion. So I think it was probably a lack of, um, lack of knowledge and a bit of naivety around that, that uh, concussion can have so many, I guess, flow on effects from, from when you actually get hit in the head. So th that's the earliest I can trace it back to. I, I think to a degree, I've always had sort of an obsessive mind. Like I've always wanted things to be done well and um, I've always wanted to train well. I've always wanted to, to sort of perfect things, which can be helpful if used in the right way. But uh, around my concussions, I think it started getting used in a more negative way for me because I never had the opportunity to sort of do what I'd done in previous times. And you end up telling yourself a lot of different stories about how you're just weak and um, you're soft and that's why you can't get over it. And all of a sudden your self-esteem goes from 
let's say seven out of 10 to three out of 10. And then you're also suffering from concussion on top of that. So I can't think of, I can't say there was a direct moment where I went, okay, or a direct symptom that I went, yeah, that's, that's bad news. I think it was just a build up over years of, of not dealing with things in the right way. And um, it eventually just hit breaking point for me where I just sort of went, my, my body and my mind couldn't take it anymore. And, and something had to give. I can see that as well when the game that you've grown up loving and that you've got a huge talent for and that people expect you to continue to do well in and have a certain degree of, or you feel a certain degree of obligation in, is also the cause of all that negative self-talk. You know, all of the way that you're looking at yourself in that way, that's the driver of it. And if only that was gone, then maybe you wouldn't have to feel it that way about yourself anymore. I can absolutely see how that would play into it. And the journey out of that, the journey toward, I guess, being able to be comfortable with the person that you are and the quality of the person that you are, but also enjoy the sport despite all the pressures. That's been an ongoing journey, hasn't it? Because you took some time off after that game. You recognized that there was a problem and that you needed to be away from the sport for a while to address that problem. That was a hugely uh, brave decision, I think, to make at that time because to me, I'm looking at your story and you're on a trajectory towards the Australian team at that point in time. You've just scored a massive double century at a professional grade event, extremely high level quality of player that you're playing against and you've made it look easy. And suddenly you've got all these text messages in your room after that, essentially congratulating you and everyone who's ever paid attention to talent in Australian cricket is paying attention to you. And then suddenly you've got to make the decision to say, I need to get away from this for a bit. That requires a huge amount of courage. How did you go about making that decision and, and what was that conversation like with the team? I think a lot of people have sort of described it to me in the way you just described it, saying it was as courageous and I didn't see it that way. It was one of those things where I just went, this is my only way out. I need to like speak to someone or sort something out because this... This isn't right. I didn't see it as courageous or anything like that in my mind. It was more, I need to just like do something differently because this isn't, this isn't working for me. Like everything in my life just doesn't feel good. Like it doesn't look good to me. It doesn't feel right. And you sort of had that dream since you were young of playing for Australia and then when it's almost staring you, in, staring you in the face. You're thinking, oh, I couldn't think of anything worse. Like, I'm already feeling bad enough as it is, and then if I'm put in that spotlight in front of the whole world, essentially, or the cricket-watching world, that's not something that I feel like I'm at a stage where I can, I can do that. It has been a journey and it still is well and truly a journey. I'm still, I'm still working on that sort of stuff every day. I'm doing different things to try and improve my life. And I sort of look back to, when was it, October 2018. And in October 2020, which we are now, I look back on it and I go, I've made so many strides in those two years, but I've still got so far to go, I think. Like, and it's one of those things where I still want to keep improving and I want to play for Australia and I want to do it for a long time, but I need to probably do more work than your average Joe to make sure that I'm mentally in a headspace that can sort of deal with, with all that stuff, especially with sort of the prior, prior things that I've gone through. So um, I think it's sort of almost, I've tried to look at it like if someone's got a dodgy hamstring, they've got to do extra hamstring rehab exercises. Um, my brain's probably been through a bit more than than your average 22 year old. So I've probably got to do a bit more sort of rehab on that to make sure that I give myself the best chance to, to succeed at that level one day. Tell me about that work that you went 100% into after that period in 2018. What, what did you do to start rebuilding yourself? Because I think there are a lot of people who are in the same position as what you were then and are looking for examples and, and pathways that they can follow to try and get back to the state that they want to be in. What was your path? So my first thing was I sort of spoke to my parents, had a really open and honest conversation with both of them. Um, I'm very close with both of them, so it was, a, it was an easy conversation to have in a way. And then it was sort of one of those ones with cricket. They hadn't really experienced anything like it before. And the whole idea of like mental health, not that 
I don't, I don't think I have a mental health issue as such. I think I just, as I said, probably my head's been through a bit, I guess, more than, more than other people and I just have to do a bit more work on it. But the thing is with me, like, I just want to sort of preface this by saying, like, 90% of the time I'm happy as anything. I love hanging out with my friends. I, I love doing what I do with cricket. I love sort of spending time with my girlfriend, with my dogs. It's just that 10% I might potentially and people that are struggling might maybe go that little bit sort of further down than maybe a normal I don't want to say normal person because it's not the right term but maybe we we just might go a bit lower than than someone else so um I think that's important to say because it doesn't just because if you get turned with a mental health uh condition as such that doesn't mean you're locked up in your room and you're hating everything that you do all the time And that time for me, I was really struggling. Like that was probably one time where um, things were pretty rough and I was, I was struggling quite a bit more than, than what I do now, for example. I, I sort of started the process by talking to people within sort of the cricket world about, about seeing some psychiatrists or psychologists or whatever, whatever they sort of recommended. So it started off as quite a, um, quite a, I guess, open field in a sense, because um, I didn't, to a degree, I didn't really know what I was meant to do or how I was meant to go about it. They sort of recommended a few people that I go and see. So I, I, I went and did that and um, probably didn't, not that I disliked them, but I just didn't quite connect with the, the work that they sort of wanted to do with me. Because when I explained what was going on in my head, the way they explained it back to me, and this is probably going to sound a bit arrogant, but it, it felt like I was in a year 12 psych class again. I'm like, I understand that I shouldn't be having these thoughts or if I detach from them, I'll, I'll feel better, but that's not the help I need. Like, I need to know how to actually deal with them, not, not get told sort of in a, in a basic sort of term what's going on and, and how, you know, if you, if you replace that thought with another thought, you'll, you'll feel better because that wasn't the problem I was having. And then... Dad actually came home one day and said he'd um, heard about this woman who her son went to Brighton Grammar, which was the school I went to, and she'd worked with a few athletes around, around sort of this space. And she did things a bit differently. And he sort of mentioned that from the start that his, her sort of uh, unique way was, was not your traditional sort of psychology or, or, or psychiatrist. Dad sort of explained how it could be a bit different, but and I was I was quite reluctant at the start. Um, but he sort of said, "Look, let's just get in contact with her and and go have a meeting, and like you don't know what could come of it. Like it could be anything." Um, It was over a cup weekend, it was over whatever cup weekend, so cup weekend 2018 and this was on the Saturday and we just had a bit of a chat and we sort of said on that Tuesday which was cup day and I remember walking into her office at 10 and I didn't leave till 3, like we were just talking and she sort of did a few little activities with me and all of a sudden I sort of felt like there was a weight off my shoulders, not in a sense that all my problems are solved but almost as if I'd been feeling all this stress and for an hour or two hours, all of a sudden, I actually felt like, hang on a minute, like I'm actually feeling, feeling decent here, like I'm feeling relaxed, like this actually isn't too bad. Um, so, yeah, so I was sort of just like, wow, this is a bit different. I actually walked out feeling a bit better and and went back and I actually slept for, I reckon, 16 of the next 24 hours. Because I'd been in such like a hyperactive state, the stuff that we'd done had relaxed me to the degree that my body had been sort of in that fight or flight response the, for God knows how long. and the way she sort of was able to relax me, I just passed out. Like, I just was like, oh, I'm cooked. Like, I 
So I, I got some much needed sleep, which I wish was the, was the um, fixer to all things. But uh, I've actually been working with her ever since and she's been the biggest difference for me just in terms of the work we've done has just been so powerful and been able to sort of shift my mindset and the way I'm able to sort of manage myself even now, even without her support sort of 24-7 and uh, sort of the processes that we've put in place have, have improved me massively and I sort of see how far I've come and how much closer I am to being ready for that next level and I'm at a stage now where I feel like I actually am and, and truly believe that I'd have the, the mental processes and sort of capabilities to, to get there. This, this journey hasn't been completely on an upward trajectory, though, for you over the last sort of 12 to 24 months as well, has it? Because a little bit later down the track in uh, 2019, you withdrew yourself from the potential for uh, representing Australia uh, at, in a similar sort of way uh, to, I guess, the experience you'd had a year prior to that uh, with the challenge of working and building yourself to the point where you felt like you were able to, to do that thing that you love. Can you tell us a little bit, I guess, about that experience? Because I think there are a lot of people who find it difficult to uh, forgive themselves for the fact that it's not always just an upward trajectory when you're working on this path, that, that there are lots of ups and downs, but that doesn't mean that you shouldn't keep trying. I think last year was definitely different to 2018. I'd come a long way, but um, probably just not enough, to be perfectly honest. I, a fair few people have asked me, do you regret pulling out? Because I was a pretty good chance to play in that game for Australia after that. So, But I, I don't feel any sort of regret at all. Looking at the situation, I sort of have tried to come up with this sort of mantra that everything will work out perfectly. Like, however, whatever happens, even if it's bad at the time, it will work out perfectly. And I was in Perth playing an Australia A game and it was sort of spoken about as you know this is the trial for for the test side and I'd sort of spent that whole um I guess season before that game and pre-season thinking like everything is going towards sort of playing for Australia this summer like I really want to do it like I have to prove people wrong from last year and you know people have doubted me because I pulled out and they've got their own sort of made up stories as to why I pulled out and everything and I sort of was just so keen and was sort of listening to all the all the media talk because I'd done pretty well at the start of the season and was probably buying into it way too much. And I remember going over to Perth and I was quite sick. I missed sort of the training session before the game and was just not in a good space. Perth was the place that the th uh, had happened basically 12 months prior as well. So probably had some bad, I guess, memories from there. I remember being over there sick, like it was hot, and I just probably went back to, to Perth again to a degree. Like I knew I'd come a long way, but I'd sort of just found myself back in that headspace again. And uh, I think it was just a reminder that I'd probably got a bit ahead of myself thinking I'd solved all these issues. Like I'd, I'd improved a lot in that year and had probably got a bit a bit lazy with a lot of the routines and stuff that I'd put in place to make myself feel good. And I'd done sort of all that. I'm going to call it head rehab because that's probably the best way I can put it. And I'd sort of got a bit lazy with my rehab in that sense. And uh, I think Perth was almost the perfect storm. But I'm sort of glad it happened because it was that wake up call. And once I'd, once I'd pulled out and officially sort of pulled the pin, I remember writing down everything that came to my mind about what had got me to where I was at that stage of my life. And I just went like, I'm, I'm coming after this. I wrote everything down, got it all out, spoke to mum and dad, spoke to the people that I trust, spoke to, spoke to everyone around me that I thought needed to sort of hear where I was at. And then from there, it just went, OK, now this is it. This is sort of the line in the sand where I just go, this is going to be, this is going to be my story where it's happened twice to a degree. And then third time, I'm going to come back and I'm, I'm going to like really dominate this thing. 
like I, I'm going to make sure I'm in the right space. And this isn't to say that I'm in the perfect space now, but I'm again a lot further down the line than I was last year. And I know probably now through experience that it's going to be an up and down sort of sort of journey. Like on on cricket days, I am going to wake up and think, why am I doing this? But I do know why, because at the end of the day, I know how rewarding it is for me personally and how rewarding it is when your team wins and when your mates do well and when you do well. And, and that's why I play, like to have a, have a beer after a hard four day or five day game and go, we've put everything into this. Everyone gave it a red hot crack, but it was actually pretty fun along the way. So um, yeah, it's been yeah quite an interesting journey so far, but I, I feel like it's only the start, which is good. I think it's a common uh, human desire to want to characterise stories in either one way or, or another, that, that it always has to be either good or it has to be bad or you have to be completely healed or you have to be completely unwell or you have to be completely capable or completely uh, incompetent. The, but in reality, of course, we all know, even just from our own lived experience, that it's never like that. You know, there's, there's always elements of all of those things happening simultaneously. And it's about how do you juggle all of those things to perform at the level that you want to and to do the things that you want to do, accepting that all of those aspects of your personality for all of us are constantly at play. And I know in medicine, it's something that we struggle with as well. There's really good statistics now around the challenges of mental health in uh, doctors and allied health and nursing staff. One of the benefits that I suppose we have in, in the hospital is that we don't have the media over our shoulders trying to commentate on that journey in a way that we can lean on, on friends and, and others and uh, professional services and that head rehab that you're talking about, but we can do it in private. Whereas for you, you were doing it in public too. And I'm just interested in your reflections about how that influenced things, because that must have had a really interesting dynamic to all of this when it's in some ways a new narrative for Australia cricket to be dealing with and, and also for the media to be dealing with as well. Yeah, it was, um, it was quite different in that sense because you had to do it in public. You had no real choice because people were would ask questions and the thing I found really hard to comprehend was and I've sort of learnt from this again because I've stopped reading basically any media surrounding cricket or or around me but I remember sort of reading things from journalists that were sort of trying to explain my situation or hearing things from journalists and I'd never spoken to them no one close to me had ever spoken to them it was far from the truth and I found that quite hard to deal with because I'm sitting there going like, you have no idea what I'm going through or what I'm trying to do here. Like you just sit behind your computer and type up an article to try and get like sort of clickbait, I guess. And I have to sit there and I have to read it and my friends and family have to read it. You thinking you're, you're in the know when you really have no idea. So for me, I found it really disrespectful as well because I'm sitting there just going like, why would you feel the need to do this stuff? Like, report on what you know not what Jim's mate from the pub told you or something along those lines so I found that really challenging but as I said I sort of learned from that and went you know what I'm just going to not read any of that stuff because it only brings sort of negativity to me and um, I guess to a degree they're just trying to do their job like you're trying to do yours in hospitals and I'm trying to do mine on a cricket field so um, yeah I found it quite difficult because it was in public but I felt like I had no real choice because there was no no other way around it. In some ways, I think you being so public about your journey uh, is combating that to a certain degree is all the speculation because when you can tell it plainly in your own voice about what you've been going through and, and how you've been managing that, it demystifies it to a certain extent. And I think when you we speak about it in this way, it resonates with a lot of people because you're far from alone in, in this. It's just that you're dealing with it on a different scale to what maybe the average person does. That was something that I didn't think about when I was sort of, or it did go public, how many messages I received from sort of random people that I didn't know, just almost expressing their gratitude that I was coming out and sort of talking about these issues and something that I found extremely sort of uh, rewarding in a sense, just because if I was helping other people just by sort of being honest it's not that like I'm not doing that much to help others and like that 
that, that probably sounds worse now that I say it out loud, but to a degree, like, it's, it's an incredibly sort of satisfying thing to know that you're helping random people get through whatever they need to get through and all I had to do was sort of be open and honest about sort of my situation. So that was something that was quite confronting but in a good way. Uh, it was, yeah, quite powerful, I think. This is the, the irony of the culture of silence around mental health issues, right, is that everyone in their own way, to various degrees, suffer from these things. But if no one talks about it, it can seem like you're the only one. And so sometimes if you've got someone in a public position who's willing to talk on a platform about it, it must be a tremendous relief to people who are surrounded by those who they just don't feel they can open up to or be honest with about what they're going through. So it's like, oh, wait, here's this guy who's literally breaking some of Australia's most highly held records, is extraordinarily talented at what he's doing, is performing at a peak level, and he's suffering from this sort of stuff. Well, maybe it's not so bad that I am. Maybe there's a way for me to perform well and, and still get through this if he can. I can imagine that must be extraordinarily powerful for many people. I like to think so. I think it's just sort of as we've discussed, it's just the journey that I've ended up taking. And it's one of those things where if I go back to the thing, if everything works out perfectly, it's probably... I'm hoping that when I'm I'm 40 and hopefully sort of sitting down with my mates or, or with my future wife or whatever it be, um, I can sit there and go, it was all worth it. I think what I've done to try and sort of achieve that or, or do some incredible things hopefully in my life, um, I'm hoping that doing all this work is really setting me up to do that. So it does fill me with with some excitement. I don't like to get too far ahead of myself, but... I, yeah, I'm hopeful that the journey I've taken, as I said, sort of takes me to, to places that, that are quite rewarding when I'm sort of older and have a family of my own and um, can sort of look back and hopefully go, yep, I, I gave everything a red hot crack and did it the best way I knew how. Well, let me get excited for you, Will. I'm, I'm super pumped about what you've achieved and, and where you're going and, and just so proud uh, to have you representing our nation in the way that you are, regardless of whether you score no runs for the rest of your career or you go on to score uh, immense records. It really doesn't matter at this point, at least to me. What matters is the quality of the person that you are and, and the way in which you're going about it. And I think that regardless of, of how your career individually goes, there will be many, many young cricket players and young athletes and I think just young people in general in the next 10 to 20 years who will look to you as an example and be better off uh, because of the way that you've conducted yourself throughout of all of this. So thank you on behalf of uh, those people and, and us in the general public at the moment. Uh, and just personally, thank you for coming on and talking to me about all of this because it means a great deal to me personally and I'm sure many people listening will also uh, find it extraordinarily valuable. Thank you very much, Chris. Thanks for having me. Before we end the show, another thanks to Altrop for sponsoring the show this week. Visit altrop.com.au and use the code RISK for 10% off your purchase of coffee. If you haven't already, please feel free to leave a review on Apple Podcasts. Leaving feedback is a great way to let us know you enjoy the show and let other people see the podcast and join the community. So thanks again for listening to this week's episode and for your ongoing support.